Hi, it's Dwyer. It's January 10th, 2022. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Right? We're going to make a lot of bold statements here, uh, but I need for you to understand that I'm just sharing my opinion. You need to do your own research and have your own. Now, let's talk Gervonta Davis. Right? Let me be clear here. I expect Gervonta Davis to beat Ryan Garcia. Right? I don't like the weight, 136. Garcia strikes me as a guy who's going to have to squeeze himself into 136. Right? He's getting older. Let's face it, too. Gervonta Davis has been more active than Ryan Garcia. Ryan Garcia sees himself as a slugger, not a boxer. Right? He wants the KO. He's going to try to throw a lot of big punches. And, of course, Gervonta Davis is going to be hard to find for him, in my opinion. So, I'm expecting Gervonta Davis to beat Ryan Garcia. But let's be clear here. If you're thinking that the fight might be as unbettable as it was this season in the NFL, betting on Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers while Tom was having marital problems early in the season, right? Understand, as I make this video, Tampa Bay is below 500. This is a Tom Brady team. Tom's a great player. But Tom's wife was leaving him. There were kids involved. At one point in the preseason, Tom took time off from the team. A lot was going on in the background. Now, with Gervonta Davis, I don't care what anyone says. It's my understanding, as of this video, the DA's office is continuing to press charges against Gervonta Davis for the latest... And yes, folks, it's just the latest domestic violence accusations thrown against him. Now, understand, the victim has recanted. I am shocked that there are some of you who seem to believe that it's okay for Davis to go after the tires of the vehicle she was driving, as long as his name's on the title. Folks, that's not the way the law works. Right? Understand, too, there's that inconvenient bruise on the inside of her mouth that the police observed when they responded to her call to them. Right? So I believe a lot's happening. Everyone smiles in front of the camera. Everyone says, I'm not a monster. How could the cops think I put my hands on my baby's mother and that I caused the fresh wound they saw when they showed up? Right? Well, just to understand, there's a lot going on in the background with Gervonta Davis, just like there was with Tom Brady. Now, some guys are able to handle it. Right? In the 70s, Ali showed up at a press conference right before a fight with a woman who people thought was his wife, but no, was a different woman. Right? Then Ali goes out, of course, and wins the fight. Well, just understand, um, it gets to some guys. Gervonta Davis, who already is settling a hit-and-run case, who already has been caught on film with his hands on a woman, now has this incident. And let's just say the fact that the DA hasn't yet dropped charges tells me that Gervonta is going to keep some lawyers busy trying to work out a deal where he has to do community service, right? Maybe spend some time at a battered woman's shelter, right? He's going to have to do something, public service announcements, to get this charge resolved, right? Think about how it was for Ray Rice when you know what hit the fan way back when. So, I expect Gervonta Davis to beat Ryan Garcia, but it's one of those deals where I'm not throwing extra money on that fight because of the stuff in the background. 
Now let's talk about Davis in a little bit more of a macro view here. I believe there is an opening for an opponent. Let's keep in mind the water runs deep at 135. The guy he just fought, Hector Garcia, is a southpaw. Davis was hit with Garcia's counter straight left hand, Garcia's dominant hand. Right? Think about it. Isn't Shakur Stevenson a southpaw like Garcia was? And isn't Stevenson now fighting at 135? Let me say this too. Stevenson has faster hands than Hector Garcia. Right? Let's look at this a little bit more deeply. Another problem opponent for Gervonta Davis at 135, in my opinion, would be Devin Haney. In fact, if Haney looks at the film and looks at the CompuBox numbers, he's going to realize this fight was a lot closer than the judges seem to think. Understand, CBS Sports here had Davis with just a two-round lead. 5-3 after eight rounds, right? Garcia doesn't come out for the ninth round. Okay, fine. But understand, if after eight rounds, Gervonta Davis only had a two-round lead, folks, this was a competitive fight with the ninth, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th to go. Right? Had Garcia finished strong, let's say 3-1, the fight would have been a draw. Understand, too, the fight hung very much in the balance until Davis gets off a left hook that greatly slowed down Garcia right before the punch. Right before that punch, Garcia is very much in the fight. So let me say this. Davis is a tale of three fighters, right? One man's opinion. He is great in the middle to late rounds when he's on his front foot. Folks, isn't he on his front foot here in the eighth round? That's his bread and butter. But on his back foot, things are complicated. He throws more punches but he doesn't land jabs. What I want folks to do, and I understand Davis is a guy where only two fights have gone the distance in his career. Let's talk about one of them, Isaac Pitbull Cruz. Cruz comes in very tight defense, has his hands close to his body. He's on his front foot. Davis gets on his back foot, and let me just say, Davis has skills. Davis is like Errol Spence. I was impressed with Davis's back foot. But understand, when Davis is on his back foot, he's a different fighter. The heavy, heavy, heavy punch doesn't really show itself. Right? He's not a knockout puncher on his back foot. What you get when you crash the pocket like Cruz did in a close fight that went the distance is you get a Davis who's throwing a higher volume of punches, a guy who's actually a boxer, not a slugger. So let me just point out here. We're going to get wonkish here. Sometimes that's what it takes. And I'm going to look at the CompuBox numbers for the Davis Pitbull Cruz fight. Would it shock you to know and understand Pitbull's on his front foot from the opening bell? Davis, the slow starter, throws 43 punches. You heard right, 43 punches in the first round. In the second round, and these are heavy numbers for Davis. Davis throws 38 punches. 
In the third round, he throws 45 punches. So on his back foot, Davis is throwing more punches. Here's the problem. Here's what Devin Haney, who's a technician, is going to circle. In the first round, Davis throws 17 jabs. He lands one. In the second round, Davis, this is against Pitbull Cruz. Davis throws 15 jabs. Now, this is a guy on his back foot. According to CompuBots, he lands no jabs in the second round. No jabs. Understand, this is a fight that goes the distance. In the third round, Davis throws 17 jabs. Davis, who's an extremely accurate, above 45%, power puncher, lands one jab out of 17 in the third round. So through the first three rounds, the first three rounds against front foot heavy Pitbull Cruz, Davis, according to CompuBox, lands two jabs. In other words, he's throwing at least 15 per round. He lands fewer jabs after three rounds against Pitbull Cruz than the number of rounds. Right now, on his back foot, Davis is excellent at pivoting and landing power shots. But understand, he can't hit you when you're aggressive with his jab. Right? Let's talk about Davis, the slow starter in general. Against Hector Luis Garcia, this last fight. Davis leaves the fight wide open, folks. It's there for the taking. Unfortunately, Hector Garcia is too respectful of him. A volume guy needs to come in and say to himself, Davis is going to be asleep at the wheel. He's going to be low volume. He's going to be Anthony Joshua the first three rounds. He's cautious. Forget the tattoos. Forget the persona. Right? Davis is cautious the first three rounds if you can keep him in the pocket, not crashing the pocket. Right? As I said, he's three fighters. Front foot, he's devastating. Devastating. Back foot, he's great throwing power shots on his back foot. Not his jab. So you want Davis in the pocket trading with you. Here's what happens when that happens. Because understand, Hector Garcia comes out and is prepared. He's a former Olympian from the Dominican Republic. He's looking to land his straight left hand. He's prepared to land on Davis. He's not in the ring to run away from Davis. So just to understand, Davis stays in the pocket. The first round, Davis throws 15 total punches. Before I was giving you the jab numbers in the Pitbull Cruise fight. Here I'm going to give you the total number of punches Davis throws in the first round. 15. According to CompuBox, he lands three of them. Right? This is not Davis on his front foot. This is Davis kept in the pocket. This is not Davis on his back foot. This is Davis kept in the pocket. Right? Davis lands three punches the entire first round. Understand how different Davis is. All three punches that he lands in that first round are jabs. So we get to the second round. Davis throws 24 punches total. He lands six punches. Six. In the second round against a guy, Hector Garcia, who's not running. He's in front of Davis. We get to the third round. Davis throws 23 punches. He lands three of them. First three rounds, 
against an opponent who is pretty much keeping Davis in the pocket. Right? Garcia is not running, so Davis is not on his front foot. Garcia is not actively pursuing Davis. This is not Davis on his back foot. This is Davis in the pocket. Davis, three rounds in, as a heavy favorite against Hector Luis Garcia. He lands three in the first round, six in the second round, three in the third round. He lands 12 punches, 12 over the first three rounds. That's four punches a round. Now, my point to you is that if you are a jabber, a taller fighter, who knows how to operate from long distance without stalking your opponent, because you don't want Backfoot Davis to show up, because Backfoot Davis actually has skills, just has a problem landing his jab, right? You don't want Backfoot Davis. You certainly don't want Frontfoot Davis. You don't want to wake Davis up. Davis is the guy who, he's the beer who you don't want to prod. So if you're Devin Haney, and you know Davis's bread and butter is a straight left, you also understand that Davis, if he gets close to you, can throw a left hook. Davis is a southpaw. That's his bread and butter. If you're a Devin Haney, and you have a jab, and you can stay outside without moving away from Davis. And you can have it so that the spacing is such that Davis is going to have a hard time getting through your jab to land his left hand. I don't see why you can't prepare to start fast against Davis. In a 12-round fight, if he's going to land 12 punches over three rounds, seems to me a jabber should be able, with feints, with volume, knowing that Davis is going to be low volume from mid-range. I don't see why a Devin Haney can't sweep the first three rounds. You want to box Davis without having Davis go on his back foot and become someone else. Right? So, let me just say, and by the way, I feel Errol Spence has this same problem. Right? Spence has a great back foot. We saw it against Mikey Garcia. Spence's meat and potatoes is when he crashes the pocket on you and is throwing these short hooks. Right? But if you can box Spence, keep him a little bit outside. Now, it's easier said than done. Right? I think Spence might fall apart a little bit. As he did in the early rounds against um, the boxer from Europe. Not Amir Khan, but the guy who just beat him in Khan's last fight. Kel Brook. Well, Davis... Understand, you want mid-range Davis. You don't want Davis the hunter. You don't want Davis the back foot boxer. You want mid-range Davis. Because if you come in ready to be aggressive early on Davis, but not too aggressive, again, you want the bear to be a little asleep. If you're prepared to just faint, faint, keep cautious Davis outside. Keep Davis's left in his holster. Right? If you come in with jabs and remind Davis of why he's cautious, because Davis doesn't want to get hit in the first three rounds of a fight. And if you just turn it into a jabbing contest, beat him with volume, beat him with spacing. In other words, if you're a righty, as you're throwing the jab, you understand that Davis's left hand lines up on your right side. 
So you want to be moving away from Davis's right side. You understand Davis is a shorter puncher. Right? So Davis doesn't have a lot of reach unless he commits to crashing the pocket. I believe that Devin Haney could sweep the first three rounds against Gervonta Davis. Now Davis, like Anthony Joshua, starts to build up a head of steam in the fourth, fifth, and sixth rounds. Right? So I believe a fighter needs to be prepared to change the dynamic at that time. Right? If you have the front foot, if you can literally tilt Davis backward, you're going to negate his power. Let's sound completely ridiculous here. This guy doesn't have the punch, but he has the front foot. In other words, this is a guy who can tilt opponents backward. In his biggest loss against Teofimo Lopez, for some reason, he didn't tilt Teofimo back on his back foot. Right? But make no mistake, I believe Lomachenko, if he gets the timing right against a Gervonta Davis, Lomachenko could come out, sweep the early rounds, at least the first three rounds, then when Davis starts to try to crash the pocket, Lomachenko would know how to jump on Davis, right? Use his core to lean on Davis, make Davis uncomfortable, try to push Davis back like Pitbull Cruz, who has a great front foot did. Right? Pitbull doesn't have the biggest punch, but yet he had Davis backing up against him. Right? Understand, if you tilt Davis backward onto his back foot, Davis loses a lot of his power. Now, I don't think Ryan Garcia is the guy to take advantage of these patterns in Davis fights. Understand, the Mario Barrios fight. Floyd says to him, player, I think you're, you know, I think this fight's close on to scorecards. You got to assert yourself here. Mid-fight. According to reports, his trainer in this fight said to him, hey, player, this fight's too close for comfort. You've got to assert yourself. Now, Davis, of course, says, you know, after the fight, that he thought the fight wasn't close. You know what? He didn't share that news with the guys from CBS Sports, did he? They had it 77-75. And this was a fight that Davis was the big favorite in. You know what happens, right? The crowd is watching the fight, then they realize, over time, slowly, this is a close fight the underdog who was supposed to get knocked out is hanging tough. Right? Then the crowd starts to chant for the underdog because nobody loves Goliath. Now, Dave, I'm telling you the round where Garcia gets clipped and everything changes after Garcia gets clipped with the left hook. Right? But that last round... Garcia is very much in the round until he gets hit with the best punch of the fight, a Gervonta Davis left hook that almost crumbles him, causes him to quit at the end of the round. Right, folks, Davis doesn't realize how close the fights are. If I'm Devin Haney, I target the early rounds. If I'm Devin Haney, I consider changing the dynamic in the middle rounds because I know Davis is going to try to be front foot heavy. So an Ali, a Mayweather, they would start to clinch you. They would start to stay in the middle of the ring and not allow you even when they're hurt to back them up to the ropes. Look at Mayweather, Shane Mosley. 
Mayweather's badly hurt in the middle of the ring. Mayweather holds on to Mosley's arm, forces the ref to break them. Right? Mayweather won't back up because he knows he's hurt. He doesn't want to be up against the ring with a guy who has him dazed. Those are the moves. Those are the moves that a Devin Haney or a Shakur Stevenson need to consider. If I'm Shakur Stevenson too, I look at this Hector Garcia fight. I look at how Hector's able to land counter straight left hands. And I say to myself, as a southpaw, which is who Shakur Stevenson is, I need to make sure I throw some counter straight left hands. Because the openings might be there. Right, truth be told, Gravante Davis is pretty slick on his back foot. When he's on his front foot, he's going for home runs. While he's devastating on his front foot, there are openings. He's not defensively blessed on his front foot. He's better defensively on his back foot. I know that's not how the public sees it. Let's shift gears and let's talk heavyweight division. Let me say this. We all have bets that we have in our back pocket that we're just waiting for the opportunity to play, right? I can tell you that in football, I was all hot and bothered over the Bengals at home against the Bills. Now, I support the NFL. The top priority has to be the life of the players. Uh, I'm so glad that Hamlin has bounced back and is healthy again. But let's just say that brief opening to that game, you saw why the Bengals are underrated in the AFC. Right now, truth be told, I think the Kansas City Chiefs win the AFC because I think Pat Mahomes is even better than advertised. And Pat has put it together with his new wide receivers. I'm looking forward to KC, who has a bye the first week, right? They're officially the one seed. They're going to have to play Buffalo at a neutral site. I'm looking forward to that game. KC against Buffalo at a neutral site. Well, in boxing, I think more than most that Usyk has an excellent opportunity against Tyson Fury. So so understand, I was ready for the coup. Not Usyk beating Fury. The next fight, it was going to be Usyk against Philippe Ergovic, who looked bad against Jean Gilly. I'm not here to say he looked good against Gilly. But understand, Ergovic throws punches at a loop. The fear with Ergovic after he hit the canvas against Gilly is his chin. I don't have as much concern. With Usyk, understand, I believe Zhang Jili is a much bigger KO threat, a much bigger threat to knock you out than Usyk. So, some sanctioning body actually ordered Usyk to make a defense against Philippe Ergovic. I was hoping that would come after a fight with Tyson Fury. Because I thought Usyk would say, wow, do I really want to fight Joe Joyce, who might walk him down, (laughs) right? Do I really want to fight Joe Joyce? Maybe I have political cover here. This is if Usyk continues his career. Maybe I have political cover here to actually fight Philippe Ergovic. And I thought Ergovic had a great shot at beating him, right? I was expecting the line to be such where I was going to get better than a plus 200 with Ergovic because of Ergovic's bad fight against Zhang Gili. And if Usyk was still the champ after Fury, well, you could imagine. Gamblers would have liked that. We would have been talking about Usyk as one of the best ever. Right? Well, that sanctioning body has backtracked. 
Now the talk is that Usyk's next opponent, should he get by Tyson Fury, should be Daniel Dubois. Right? Well, let me just say, talk about a bad last fight. <laughs> I'm here complaining about Ergovic getting knocked down once uh, in going the distance against Zhang Zhili. Right? Just to understand, Dubois got knocked down <laughs> three times in the opening round, right? He was struggling in that fight. He's getting hit flush. So uh, what I want people to consider here and understand Dubois, according to reports, has a torn ACL, which should KO any hope of him being competitive against Usyk, right? But what I want people to consider is if Dubois gets healthy, when he gets healthy, I know it's counterintuitive, right? Me saying that Fury, who I consider a historical great, is going to have a hard time with Usyk, and then giving credit to Dubois. But understand, a healthy Dubois would give Usyk a tough time because Dubois has fast hands. Dubois is aggressive. Right? Dubois is the kind of guy who even Joe Joyce was hesitant to charge. Joyce actually wins that fight with a jab, maintaining a distance from Dubois. Right? I think Usyk would have a hard time with Dubois because I believe Dubois would come out firing. Now, don't get me wrong. Dubois has defensive lapses. But I'm curious as to whether Usyk's punch would translate. I know critics will point out that the guy who knocked down Dubois three times in his last fight was a cruiserweight. Okay, fair enough. But let's just say Dubois has such fast hands that you wouldn't want to be in a shootout against him. Let's also remember, too, Dubois, because of an eye injury against Joyce, quits in that Joyce fight, but that stoppage took place several rounds into the fight. Right, several rounds into the fight. And as I said before, contrast Joyce's performance against Joseph Parker, where Joyce is just coming in the pocket with Joyce's much more reserved performance against Daniel Dubois, and that'll tell you the challenge opponents of Dubois face. Right? So let's pay attention to the whole heavyweight musical chair situation. Clearly, we're going to have a huge fight, Tyson Fury against Usyk. Fury's the favorite. If Fury wins that fight, okay, great. Fury can pick who he wants to fight, right? I believe Fury has been champion long enough where he's going to get the benefit of the doubt, where a lot of contenders, a guy like Joe Joyce, for example, who wants legitimacy, is going to pass on other fights so he can get a shot at Tyson Fury, right? People understand the king is Tyson Fury, especially if he be too sick. But should Fury lose that fight? Let's all pay close attention to the mandatories that Usyk would have to fight if Usyk decides he wants to keep all the belts. He might not. Right? This is an era type thing. Just like Joshua is talking about wanting to fight Deontay Wilder. Right? Usyk in the past has talked about wanting to fight Deontay Wilder. Let's face it. Wilder, Usyk, Fury, they're all in their mid-30s. Right? A guy like Usyk might say, hey, all you young guys, good luck. You guys fight each other. I'm an unbeaten. <laughs> there are going to be fans showing up for my fight who consider the most important belt I hold to be the lineal. 
right? If there was a question on who was the lineal, Usyk answered it. If, since he's already beaten Joshua, some people thought Joshua was the lineal, right? Just to understand, Usyk would have then beaten Tyson Fury, the only other guy with a credible claim to the lineal. So, <laughs> if you're a young guy, if I'm Philippe Ergovic, or if I'm Joe Joyce, and I get offered a shot at Usyk, should he beat Fury, that's the path to the greatest credibility. Even though there's a lesser belt out there, Dubois, people understand Dubois' belt is a lesser belt. Not to be confused with the lineal belt. Let me close with this. I believe one of the biggest fights of the year, and I think it's going to be a coming out party, is going to be Caleb Plant against David Benavides. Right? Understand, whatever the rankings, I consider Benavides, who's unbeaten as I make this video, to be one of the top talents in the sport. Right? It's a fascinating fight because Caleb Plant's going to be moving. Right? Here's the problem. You know, Benavides acts like he's a thug. He's actually a technician. What that means is, in my opinion, one-handed fighters really have no shot against him. Right? He knows Caleb Plant is basically a left hand. Right? He, he knows that. He's not going to fall for an orthodox stance or anything like that. He knows Caleb Plant's a left hand. How did Caleb Plant beat Anthony Durrell? Double left hook. One of the combinations of the year from 2022. If you're one-handed, to me, you have little chance against... Benavides. I'm expecting Benavides to catch up to and stop Caleb Plant. But here's the wrinkle. There's a guy out there, and they're all with the same promotional group now. He fought on the undercard of the Gervonta Davis card um, this last weekend, and he's two-handed. He's dangerous. He's unbeaten. He just hasn't had the opportunity to fight the biggest names. His name is Demetrius Andre. And he wants to fight the winner of Caleb Plant, David Benavides. Right, folks? I look forward to that fight. Right? Let's just say that's on my wish list. Now, I agree. Uh, sanctioning bodies would have to get involved and... Promoters would have to get involved, and who knows how the whole thing plays out. But understand, what makes Andre special is that unlike Plant, in my opinion, and I'm just giving you one man's opinion, Andre's two-handed. And Andre is that rare fighter who can go rounds without allowing a pocket to form. So you would have the ultimate spectacle because understand, Benavides is awfully tough in the pocket, right? Benavides is home if you're in the pocket trying to trade with him. And that includes even big hitters like David Lemieux, who Benavides took out early. The question is, can you stay away from Benavides long enough to win a majority of the rounds? For most, the answer is no. We don't know the answer when it comes to Demetrius Andre. Now, there are red flags. There's a big age gap between the two fighters. Right? Benavides is younger. Benavides has stamina. Right? Let's just say this could be a hell of a year for Benavides. Right? If he beats Plant, then is still healthy, right? Because you know how boxing is. You could beat a guy, have a gash over your head that no boxing commission is going to allow you to fight with, and then have to heal, and then things get complicated. The guy you wanted to fight gets an offer from somebody else 
right? A Canelo could step in and say, hey, Andre, you've been calling me out. Here I am. And I could see Andre saying, hey, what the hell? <laughs> you know, let me fight a living legend for more money, right? But if Benavides beats Plant and is healthy, and if Andre doesn't get some superstar offer, right, you'll want to circle any date that they list that Benavides andre fight because those are two of the better fighters in the entire sport. And their styles are such that at the start of the first round, there would be a lot of mystery and intrigue, right? Benavides would be there trying to cut off the ring. Right? Andre would be there moving. The question would be, which style would trump the other? The answer is unclear. That's a great fight. Uh, now that Andre is at 168, there's another question too. Benavidez, heavy puncher at 168. Can Andre handle the weight? Right? There's also, understand, Benavidez has a lot going on. He used to spar, believe it or not, with not only Gilberto Ramirez, but with the guy who just beat him. You know him. The best at 175, Dimitri Bevel. Right? Depending on what happens in that Anthony Yard, Arthur Perturbia fight. Right? Because you know Bevel's first choice is to fight Perturbia, who was a decorated amateur. But if Anthony Yard wins that fight, does Bevel fight Yard? That would be a great fight. Or does Bevel think to himself, hey, I used to spar with Benavides. My movement in combination punching might be able to frustrate his in-the-pocket heavy artillery. Right? So let's just say a lot's happening at 168, 175. Understand, too, Andre... <laughs> wants to fight Jamal Charlo, right? A guy with a belt at 160, right? So expect big fights for these guys in 2023. Uh, 168, 175, wow. A lot's happening, folks, in those weight classes. Those are my thoughts for now. Let me hear yours. Tell me the big story, the big stories in the sport that I'm overlooking, right? I want to talk about fights that are actually happening. I don't want to spend another minute of my life talking about Crawford Spence, which doesn't seem to be happening, right? I want to talk about things like Plant Benavides, <laughs> where the guys have a contract at a date, right? I want to talk about fighters like Demetrius Andre, who just fought, who's talking about wanting to fight the winner of Plant Benavides, who's talking about wanting to fight unbeaten Jamal Charlo, right? And quite frankly, who has a style where he's going to be dangerous in any fight. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.